okay guys uh, now we are going to talk about uh, the protein kinase A or it is also called an A kinase now the a a activity of A kinase is really really important during the glycosin metabolism as we will see later but as we also know that A kinase uh, is a very very good uh, or important precursor during uh, the cell signaling pathway via the G protein coupled receptor so as we know that G protein coupled receptor after the activity of G protein coupled receptor we can activate much more amount of cyclic AMP as we can see here so there are lots of cyclic AMPs uh, are activated after the G protein coupled receptor a step uh, from ATP to cyclic AMP is made via the enzyme called adenylate cyclase. Now this cyclic AMP will directly act on uh, this uh, A kinase or protein kinase A as a result of that we will see different activities. Now first let's talk about the structure of protein kinase A. As you can see in this picture the protein kinase A is it's a tet uh, it's actually a tetrameric uh, protein. Among this tetramer two are dimers which are the homodimer and another two are another homodimers so two homo two type of uh, subunit uh, proteins are attaching with each other to make dimers so this is uh, suppose this is uh, the protein type a and uh, a so this is uh, a1 and a2 makes uh, which which attach with each other to make a dimer and this is the b1 and b2 makes a uh, this unit okay so actually at, as we can see two of the dimers are making uh, mm, uh, the regulatory domain of that protein so this b1 and b2 in this case are making the regulatory unit of this protein kinase a and uh, on another hand this a1 and a2 are uh, making the catalytic subunit of that protein so in this protein we are having a one catalytic subunit so this is a catalytic subunit and this b1 and b2 are the regulatory subunit so what happened when the cyclic amp come and attach with this regulatory subunit because the regulatory subunit I, I, are having the place of cyclic amp binding whenever cyclic amp come and bind with uh, this regulatory subunit what happens this catalytic subunits are getting clipped out of uh, this whole sequence and they are getting released so these are the catalytic subunit as you can see here they are getting released into the environment and as a result they become activated so whenever this catalytic sub subunits are cleaved out from this whole overall structure uh, overall structure of tetrameric structure of the protein kinase a they are become active now after this activation of this protein kinase a catalytic domains they will perform further tasks what type of tasks now as the name suggests kinase as we know that kinase means the protein which love to tag phosphate group which love to tag sorry sorry for my handwriting and al also my mouse is troubling so sorry for all this so they love to tag phosphate groups they love to tra tag this phosphate groups into uh, other protein moieties so if there is another protein X so they love to tag the phosphate group on X to finally make them activated sometimes or sometimes make them deactivated okay so if we go future slides so we can see here now this is the picture which illustrates all this so now look at this if this is an inactive uh, protein kinase A though they, they cannot exhibit uh, like their uh, like this monomeric unit so they are a tetrameric unit uh, cyclic AMP come in bind with uh, the regulatory domains and uh, in turn this catalytic domain is getting clipped out and become activated now we are having the activated uh, protein kinase A or A kinase now this activated A kinase go on and what it does it actually transfers the phosphate group from ATP into some protein in this case the protein is called phosphorylase kinase so as you can see this is another type of kinase that means this is another type of protein which have which is having the capability of transferring phosphate group into another protein so in turn it is actually making a loop of actions so uh, this is the first trigger of the actions is ac protein kinase a acts on this inactive phosphorylase kinase as a result this phosphorylase kinase is become activated as a result of phosphate binding and this binding can be established by the protein kinase A uh, via the transfer of uh, phosphate from ATP and finally the ATP is converted to ADP and it is being released now this uh, uh, this phosphorylase kinase become active as well as as soon as the phosphate binds to them now it, we are we are having an activated phosphorylase kinase uh, which is denoting here with this uh, kind of 
uh, thing. Now this activated phosphorylase kinase, as it is a kinase, it has the capability of activating another protein. Now what they are doing? They are activating another protein, which are in turn is the glycogen phosphorylase. So what phosphorylase type of uh, enzymes are doing? Phosphorylase enzymes are naturally enzymes which phosphorylates different things. So they are also something which can phosphorylate other proteins. So they can also phosphorylate things out. That's why we call them phosphorylates. And the, the, in this case, they are glycogen phosphorylase. That means the substrate for their phosphorylation are glycogen. So what glycogen phosphorylase are doing? They are, they, are, they are having the capability of transferring phosphate group onto the glycogen to finally break down the glycogen unit into small part which is which are called the glucose one phosphate. Okay, because glucose are uh, the monomeric subunit which can arrange to make this glycogen, right? So, so activated phosphorylase kinase go on and in turn activate uh, this glycogen phosphorylase via again the phosphate addition. Okay, so again they add phosphate group into glycogen phosphorylase to make them activated. Here we have the activated form of uh, uh, glycogen phosphorylase. And again, this glycogen phosphorylase can go and activate, uh, go and a uh, phosphorylate substrate. The substrate in this case is glycogen. So they add a phosphate group into glycogen. As a result, what they produce is they produce this glucose one phosphate. And each round, and in all of these round, whenever they attach one phosphate into glycogen, one glucose one uh, phosphate is released from that glycogen chain. So in turn, if we think this is our glycogen chain, if we if we draw our glycogen chain like that. So e each time when they attach each single glycogen, so each of them can be cleaved out. First uh, one is g gone after uh, the attachment of the phosphate via the glucose one phosphate, then attach another phosphate and that cleaves out, then another phosphate and cleaves out. That's how a whole glycogen chain is getting shriveled out like that. Okay. So glycogen chain is uh, broken into glucose one phosphate residues. So this glucone one, uh, glucose one phosphate residues can enter into process called glycolysis. As we know, they are ingredient of glycogen. Glycolysis. So glycolysis uh, can take up this glucose one phosphate, and after the glycolysis pathway, it can generate energy. Why they need to put energy in? Because as we can see in this in this previous steps, of uh, ATP consumption is done because ATP is needed in both the cases for the kinase protein to function. If there are no ATP, then this kinase protein cannot function because the, their functionality is solely depend on ATP. Okay. So <coughs> right after the ATP consumption, they need to produce ATP to make it balanced. So that's why they need to go through the glycolysis to compensate that uh, thing. So everything uh, in the cell, uh, as you can see, are balanced in a very, very clever and specific manner. So nothing is wasted, actually. OK, so that is uh, how the protein kinase A is acting, and protein kinase A is actually doing things. Now, another thing I must tell you about this point, that protein kinase is activating the glycogen phosphorylase. Not only they're activating this glycogen phosphorylase by phosphorylation, but they can also inactive another type of protein, which is called, uh, which is called the glycogen synthase. So we have another protein, which we call the glycogen synthase. Now, uh, they block the activity of this glycogen synthase via the phosphorylation. So as we, as we have told that uh, if we attach, so suppose we have a protein A, you have a protein B. So suppose we phosphorylate protein A, this protein becomes activated. But that doesn't mean that phosphorylating all the protein uh, make them active. Okay, but uh, example, for example, this protein B, we phosphorylate protein B, but this phosphorylation in turn, in case of protein B, makes them inactive in that case. Okay. So these things are really important. Okay, so phosphorylation protein B makes this protein B inactivated. So that can happen. So again, in this case, the phosphorylation of glycogen phosphorylase makes them active. But the phosphorylation by the same protein, by this phosphorylase kinase, this phosphorylase kinase activate glycogen phosphorylase, and that makes glycogen phosphorylase activated. But this uh, phosphorylase kinase can also phosphorylate glycogen synthase, and as a result of this phosphorylation, this glycogen synthase becomes deactivated. Now, why it is necessary to deactivate glycogen synthase in the reaction when they activate the phosphor uh, glycogen phosphorylase? Because the activity of glycogen phosphorylase is to break down glycogen into glucose, but the activity of glycogen synthase is to produce glycogen from glucose. So if we need to maintain the right thing, so suppose uh, we are this is this is a circular process like like that. So if we draw a glycogen here, so this is the gly sorry, this is the glycogen. 
again the mouse is totally bad now you get the glycogen and this is the glucose for example now you are shuttling from glycogen to glucose and in other term glucose to glycogen now what happens let me change the color here yeah what happens if we add uh, this uh, glycogen phosphorylase this glycogen phosphorylase convert the glycogen into glucose so this is the glycogen phosphorylase and what this glycogen synthase are doing they are producing glycogen from glucose so this is glycogen synthase okay this is the activity so this activity is tightly controlled via the, the uh, phosphorylase kinase so what this phosphorylase kinase is doing in this case the phosphorylase kinase as you can see here phosphorylase kinase is phosphorylating uh, the glycogen phosphorylase as well as they are phosphorylating glycogen synthase so as a result the phosphorylation of glycogen phosphorylase active the, mm, the, this enzyme as a result glycogen is getting broken down into glucose so we have higher amount of glucose as uh, we are going on but what happens as a result of the phosphorylation of glycogen synthase they become inactive so there is less production of glycogen from glucose so what we have we are having only one directional process okay and that is totally controlled by this phosphor uh, phosphorylase kinase so this part is really really important this kind of shuttle is really really important because if this protein kinase if, if this phosphorylase kinase is malfunction in this case if if any uh, anyhow it is, this is malfunctioning so overall process can be damaged and if it is this process is damaged then what happens so there will be no net gain of glucose or no net gain of glycogen so whatever glycogen is breaking down into glucose can be again restored back into glycogen okay so there will be no net gain because when the cell need glucose we need to produce glucose we need to shut down one pathway we need to shut down this pathway when the cell need glycogen when the cell have enough glucose we do not need glucose in the bloodstream we need to shut down that pathway in, pathway in that case and we need, to, we need to activate this pathway so this is the this is depend upon the time and the demand of the cell for glucose or glycogen okay so that is really important and depending upon that cell signaling is working okay so that's it and i hope that's going to help you thank you